and a Thika medical advisor. And um, I think most people who've been in this group for a long time know she's a phenomenal um, person on top of all of those, those accolades. Um, so I'm gonna turn it over to you. Thank you for being here. We really appreciate you, Dr. Grubbs. Absolutely, and, and appreciate it. Hi everyone, I'm Libby Grubbs. Um, for those of you who, who I don't know, finally became a professor um, a couple of years ago at Anderson and um, am a surgeon, uh, but promise I'm, I'm an, a, a, a surgeon who um, works really well in a multidisciplinary environment um, that we have at Anderson um, with our um, medical uh, team, our endocrine oncologist, our pathologist, everyone, we all work very closely together. Um, I'm actually a little sad. The last time I gave this talk, Naifa Busaidi and I gave it together and it was like, it was like a, it was a great comedy routine. It won't be that today, but maybe next year we can get it back. Um, but she's coming to give a talk later. And um, so just a, again, a little bit about me. I have been at at Anderson since I, I, I did all my training at Duke and then went to Anderson um, in 2006 to just do two years of, of training in Texas. Uh, and then I was going to go back to North Carolina. I'm from North Carolina originally. Um, and then just had the opportunity to stay at Anderson and do endocrine you know, work within endocrine surgery um, and just had tremendous mentors, uh, Bob Gagel and Gil Cody. We were just talking about them or two. Uh, Bob Gagel would be one of the giants in medullary thyroid cancer and, um, and, and trained me and, 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 and really taught me everything I, I know um, about this disease. And so he is also a person who was from day one told us we you will always go to Thika. You will be at Thika every year. And we all learned we go to Thika every year. And so um, we love that you have Anderson folks um, that that come and we will always come when we're invited because um, we, we all believe in this so so tremendously. So um, I, I've been really fortunate at, at Anderson to, to have a, a clinical practice all in endocrine surgery. Most of it now, um, as I get older, is, is mostly thyroid based. Um, I, I used to do everything, adrenal, thyroid, parathyroid, and some pancreas, and now I'm all almost all thyroid. And then um, when I started, um, again, medullary thyroid cancer was just the, the disease for me that just I had the most questions about with the fewest answers. Um, and I also just had the, um, the luck of being in the right place at the right time um, where I was allowed to, to study this disease. So this disease really is, a, um, is, is, my, is my passion. It's what I do from a uh, work on from a research standpoint, um, along with the rest of the team. So today I was tasked with um, uh, you know, um, Gary gives us the titles of these and, and we do what Gary says, but my, mine is medical management at the beginning of the journey. But what I will tell you is we can talk about whatever you guys want to talk about today. Okay. <laughs> I know how this goes. I've been, this is not my first radio. Um, so we'll talk about what y'all want to talk about. Um, I will say that some of the, the advanced management stuff, um, getting into the medical therapies, Knife is going to be, do a really nice job on that um, tomorrow. And then I think there are a couple actually of advanced. So I want, I'd love if you want to, we can talk about some of it and we can talk about, you know, therapy and the neoadjuvants, like how, how some of it goes with, with surgery, with some of the, the um, targeted therapies, but some of that stuff, I might say, you can ask me, but I might say, Hey, let's wait and ask Nifa tomorrow because she's really going to delve into it. Um, so, so with this, and I just want to start by saying, um, uh, I, I am also a member of ITOG, which is the International Thyroid Oncology Group. Um, for those of you who, who um, may know about that, that's a group that brings together a bunch of researchers across the world to look at advanced thyroid cancer, including medullary. And, and Dwight Vicks um, is, uh, was the, 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 is the husband of, of Jean Vicks, who was a, a, an MTC patient who um, unfortunately passed away from her disease, um, but wanted ITOG to happen. And I always think of this, I took this picture this summer, I was at Glacier National Park and you can't quite see it, but there's a, a butterfly there in the purple colors. It just reminds me of a thyka and, and Jean Vicks and everything. And so I, I really, um, I always start things with, with that. So I will say that, um, one thing, you know, we try to do, as physicians, we do try to make decisions based on evidence, right? I mean, that's something that we are, are, are taught at a young age in our um, medical journey is look at the data and, and use the data to help bolster what you do. 
The hard thing with a rare tumor like medullary thyroid cancer that has what a prevalence of 13,000 people is where are you getting that evidence, right? It just doesn't exist. So I will say that um, we use things and I'm going to talk about uh, today from the standpoint of the American Thyroid Association MTC guidelines, because I think they are a very good set of guidelines, not not that's not the the book that you have to use for everything it's not the answer key but it's a good set of guidelines and i'll kind of use that as kind of my anchor to say this is what i would do and this is what we tend to do at anderson and this is what the ata says and sometimes we agree and sometimes we don't always agree even though a number of our um, uh, physicians are, are on this document but why I'm saying this is a lot of the things that come out of the medullary thyroid cancer guidelines for the ATA, there's not a lot of data for. A lot of it is expert opinion. And so just, just know that um, there's a new set of guidelines that'll be coming out probably end of 2024 to beginning of 2025. Um, Mimi Hu, who is um, from MD Anderson, if any of you guys know her, she's one of the, the co-chairs on it, along with Manisha Shah from Ohio State. Um, and they're working hard on, on doing a lot of this. Um, but, but these guidelines are, are, are a good start for us. The other thing is we use a lot of different gu um, of guidelines to, to help us. We don't just depend on, on one set to say this is, this is gospel. Um, the NCCN, the National Comprehensive of Cancer Network. They are um, also another group of experts that, um, that works on uh, with thyroid cancer um, and does guideline updates on thyroid cancer and has a, a nice, a pretty robust section on medullary. That's, that's a place we also get our data. Um, you can't see it well, sorry, but down here it says there's an NCCN guideline for patients available at NCCN. Um, I've looked at it for medullary. It, it's a, it's got some nice um, data in it as well, and, and could be a resource um, that you that you may want to check out. And then there are different groups like Nanets and others that um, will come together and and look at the data for medullary and make um, make recommendations as well. So we use all of these things when we make um, decisions about about this disease. Okay, so again, I feel like. I feel like this is going to be like we have training wheels on here. So I'm going to talk about this and then you guys are going to tell me what you want to talk about. But, you know, what can I expect after I'm at first diagnosed with MDC? I, I feel like for some of us, this is going to be a while ago. Um, but, but, you know, the idea is patients do come to us all the time, um, you know, having been first diagnosed. And, um, and it's really important from the, from the jump um, to, to make sure that we are asking the right questions and gathering the right information so that we can make the right decisions. You know, first visits, again, history and physical, oh God, I, I'm in education as well. I take care of our surgical oncology fellows. And, you know, they have, I think they've forgot to teach them how to do um, histories and physicals. But in this disease, really, really important, right? Understanding things about, um, you know, when we ask about um, secretory diarrhea, um, when we ask about other symptoms that could be related to other hereditary components that could go with this disease, when we ask about a family history, um, these are all really important things to do in medullary thyroid cancer. And then the physical exam is is equally important. You know, being able to um, to to feel someone's neck, to be able to listen to someone's voice. Um, to be able to have these conversations and, and elicit symptoms that they have is really important. Um, I, hopefully everyone in this room is aware that of, of germline RET testing. I think that's something that is, is crucial um, for all patients with MTC to understand and know that they need to be tested for. Um, and and we, we think that that should be done most often in the setting of genetic counseling. Um, it's important for people to not only understand that medullary thyroid cancer is hereditary about a quarter of the time, but it's also important them, for them to understand why they should undergo germline testing to see if they carry the gene that is passed on from family member to family member. And to know what, you know, whenever we hear about having a hereditary disease, it brings up all sorts of questions in our mind about insurance and other things. And that's where the genetic counselor comes in and really can help lay out where we are in 2023, 2024, what it means to, to be tested. Um, because I think a lot of time people don't get tested because they have this fear of what's going to be on their record and they need to know what their, what their um, rights are and, and, um, and
and what the benefit of, of getting tested um, allows. And we'll talk a little bit more about what it, why we get tested in a minute. Um, Things like other things people should expect, uh, and many of you know this as well, but the calcitonin and CEA levels, and we'll talk a little bit more about that, but that goes hand in hand with these first visits. Um, the comprehensive neck um, uh, evaluation by imaging. Usually we say ultrasound, sometimes CT will be additive to that. Um, we don't do a lot of MRIs just because as surgeons, we're, we're much more attuned to using CTs, um, but, but some kind of comprehensive ultrasound um, is, is, um, is essential in this disease for planning. Um, and then again, I put kind of graying CT of the neck. And the reason I did that is the ATA guidelines, this is things that should happen on first visits for all patients that have been diagnosed with MTC. Um, and I absolutely agree with all of this. And this is something that, that should occur. Um, so just sometimes it's easy to kind of put it in the context for me of a patient who walks into my, my clinic. And here's like a 65 year old woman who, who comes in with a thyroid nodule that she can, she can feel on herself and admits to having diarrhea five times to six times a day. Otherwise she doesn't, you know, have other symptoms when, when you ask. And she, you know, on exam had a, a left-sided thyroid nodule and had a biopsy um, and it came back as medullary thyroid cancer. Now, some of you may say, well, that's not my experience. I did a biopsy and it did not come back as medullary thyroid cancer. People were like, I don't know what this is. Um, and that is a real thing that we see because again, this is a rare disease and sometimes it's hard and medullary thyroid cancer doesn't, each little C cell doesn't wear a name tag that says, hi, hello, I'm Bob, I'm a, a medullary thyroid cancer. Um, and so sometimes it doesn't work that way. I will say that with molecular testing that is becoming more and more um, available and more often done that the it, you know, the, the algorithm, especially if there is a ret mutation and that can be a non-germline ret mutation, um, really is helping to make it more sensitive to, to make these diagnoses on FNA. But we'll talk a little bit about if you didn't know you had a diagnosis of MTC when you first got your thyroid out and what does that mean? Like what I sh what should I be doing since, you know, I already had a first um, treatment with surgery and, and, and then I got the diagnosis after I had that. What does that mean for me? And we, we'll talk a little bit about that. Um, so, so what do we do next in this setting? So when the diagnosis is made as, as MTC, as we talked about, we go ahead and get the, the calcitonin and the CEA, we go ahead and get the red testing, we go ahead and get the imaging. And then usually at this point, we talk about involving the surgeon. Um, okay, why the genetic counseling? So again, two forms of medullary thyroid cancer. Hereditary around 20 to 25%. Again, that means that you've got, you have a little mutation in your 10th chromosome on the, that, um, for, that encodes a protein um, that, uh, that um, if it's mutated, causes medullary thyroid cancer. It's a proto-oncogene, which means it turns the switch on and it, it, it causes kind of an unregulated growth of cells. And you, we can tell whether you have this mutation by taking either a blood or saliva sample and checking to see whether you have that. Um, again, um, that's about 20% of patients, about 80% then are not gonna have that germline mutation. Now, where people get confused is, they'll be told they have a ret mutation. They're like, no, 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 I don't have a ret mutation. I had germline testing. I had my blood drawn and they said I didn't have that. What sometimes happens is now more and more we're testing people's tumors to see if they have a mutation, especially as we're thinking about them going on therapy. Um, and ret mutation is the most common non-germline mutation, just because we want to make this challenging. Um, but is also found in the tumor in tumors of patients that have non-hereditary or sporadic disease. So just a reminder again, if you've got the hereditary form of disease, I can draw blood because you've got that ret mutation in every cell in your body because it was passed down in your family from when you were, you know, one cell. And every time your cells replicated, that little mutation went to every cell. So every cell in your body has it. When you have a sporadic ret mutation, that means that 
It is not in every cell in your body. It just is a mutation within um, the, tu the, the medullary thyroid cancer tumor itself, because it is also a type of mutation that happens um, in the non-hereditary. I'm gonna stop there. I'm not trying to confuse folks, but this is something that comes up a lot. Does everybody understand that? Is that cool? I, yeah, I know I'm speaking to experts. I'm, tell me to move along. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, sure. It's only 15 pages and you have to do it before you guys go to a happy hour tonight. But other than that, all right. So again, bottom line, all patients should get tested for it. Okay, for the germline mutation. And why is that? Well, because two reasons. Number one, if you've got that germline mutation, right? You have a, a pretty high chance of developing medullary thyroid cancer within your lifetime. And if we wanna talk a little bit more about the hereditary side of things and that, I've got a whole different set of slides that I can whip out it after this, but you've got a high chance of that. So, so um, there's that, but also if you've got MEN2A, which is one flavor um, of a, a hereditary MTC syndrome, you also are at risk of having um, pa a, a, parathyroid hyperplasia, um, which is not a malignancy, but if your parathyroids are working too well, too much of a good thing is bad, and we have to deal with parathyroids that are overacting. Um, and then the other thing that can overact is your adrenals, which are these little glands that are little hats that sit on the top of our, our kidneys, and they make a lot of hormones for us, including adrenaline. When, um, when you have MEN2A and MEN2B, you're at a heightened risk of having one of these, uh, of, of these little tumors called a pheochromocytoma, or as we call them, pheos. Again, not a malignancy in this setting, but again, making too much of a good, a good thing. Too much adrenaline, not a good thing, right? And so we have to treat those. So we want to know whether you have a germline mutation, because we need to go check in for these things, right? And we need to follow you up year after year usually with just blood tests to make sure that they aren't developing. The other reason we talk about getting germline testing is because you, if you have this um, disease that's hereditary, very good chance that family members, right, also have it. And we want to get them tested because we wanna know whether they have the mutation or not. In the perfect world, we would find out they have the mutation before they ever develop medullary thyroid cancer and we can take care of the disease before it even starts. This is one of these rare diseases where we can see a cancer coming down the tracks three miles away and we can decide to take care of it before it becomes a problem, um, which is what all of us in cancer think of as the closest to finding a cure for cancer as you can get. So that's one of the other reasons we really, really want people to get tested um, because then if they're positive, then we work with genetic counseling to talk with other family members that need to get tested. Um, and that's, that's, that's one of the hardest things I think my patients with hereditary MTC do. They feel this guilt that they're the per first person that had it and they have to go tell family members to do it, but it's nobody's fault. It's just the, you know, it's just the, the luck of the draw with the mutation. And here we are, let's make the best of it. This was the hand we were dealt. Let's, let's go. Um, okay, so there's that germline mutation that we talk about that the RET, that proto-oncogene just means it turned on a light switch and there's no turning it off and these cells are just replicating. Okay, so I, I'll tell you, I, 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 there's, there's very little surgery that's an absolute emergency with medullary thyroid cancer. That's the first thing to know. All right, anybody that's like, you need your, you need your thyroid out tomorrow, it, take, take a breath. I know it's an emergency of the mind. Um, but most of the time I will say, let's get your RET testing, your germline RET testing back first before we go to surgery. If that is not a possibility for a number of reasons, either you're not in an area where you can get to a genetic council to get that testing done, or it's just not in the cards or the sample got lost and you're like, my gosh, I just want, I want to move forward. Then before surgery, there are certain things you have to do if you don't know that you're, what your germline RET status is. Um, and that is number one, you need to assess for that tumor in the adrenal, um, because if you have that tumor, what happens, you know, the fight or flight thing with, with, um, with adrenaline, right? You see a bear, like your, your adrenaline goes up and you know, you can run out of there. So adrenaline is really good when you're stressed, right? Like periods of stress, our adrenaline goes up. Well, if you were going to go get your thyroid out, your body doesn't realize that me coming at you with a, with a knife is not stress, right? It's a very 
it's a very controlled stress, but your body reacts to that as holy smokes, that's a big stress and your adrenaline will surge. And if, if we don't know that, you, we can put you in situations where your adrenaline surges, your blood pressure goes up and you can have hypertensive crisis stroke and, and die. Now, you don't hear a lot about this anymore because we know to, to check for these things, but that was a way in the past that a lot of patients with hereditary medullary thyroid cancer passed away is because they had a FEO that, that was unchecked and, um, and, and they succumbed to, to, to stroke or, um, or um, uh, from hypertensive crisis. Um, so we would want to know that because if you had a FEO, we would treat the FEO before we would ever take out the medullary thyroid cancer. We would treat that first, get rid of that thing that was causing the problem, and then go back and do the surgery that takes care of your, your medullary thyroid cancer. Same with the parathyroids, that if you have a parathyroid that's hyperfunctioning, oh gosh, do we want to know that before surgery? Because we're going to be right in the neighborhood, right? And we want to take care of that problem. Those poor little parathyroid glands snuggle up right next to the, the, the thyroid, and we would want to take care of those uh, at it. So that's why knowing this before surgery, either knowing that you have the right mutation is, is essential, or if you can't, then make sure you're ruling out that you have those two other things right now so that, um, so that they can be taken care of appropriately. Um, okay. So so what, is, uh, what, uh, what, what are we looking for um, when MTC has been diagnosed? Okay, so we already talked a little bit about this, but you know, when I talk to patients and they come in, we do wanna understand diarrhea because again, um, we'll get into this. And I think a lot of you, I, I'm not speaking out of turn when you know what calcitonin it is, it is a biomarker. It does cause a secretory diarrhea. And so folks that, uh, that have had this disease for years may have, you know, diarrhea that no one put together was because of their medullary thyroid cancer, but we can understand kind of start getting a history of how long this has been going on um, by, by eliciting that kind of information. We talk signs and symptoms of FEO or hyperparathyroidism or many for FEO. Oh man, people will talk about just, you know, that surge of adrenaline, they get really angry. Like they're like, I don't know, I get really stressed. I get really, um, I, you know, I, I get sweaty just hanging out, like not doing anything. And all of a sudden I'll just break out into a sweat. They'll get tack, they'll get heart racing, all sorts of things that, that we ask about. And then hyperparathyroidism um, is a little more silent, um, but we're talking about things related to high calcium, could be constipation can be difficulty with sleeping, things like that. MEN2B is, is a different entity. It's really rare, but we there's a certain habitus that 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 um, people are tall and thin and, and have um, uh, uh, often raised bumps on their lips and tongues. Um, and then we sometimes can look in patients with more advanced disease, disease for um, signs and symptoms of Cushing's because medullary thyroid cancer can actually secrete um, ACTH, which causes the adrenal to make cortisol. Um, and you'd have excessive cortisol. It's all about the hormones and what we do. So, so what is the management of MTC? So the first thing I wrote down is not meant to be um, an absolute. And it's also taken with a grain of salt that I appreciate not everybody can get to a high volume center. And we understand that, but it is a rare disease. And so we would be remiss if we didn't say that if you can get to a center that sees a lot of this and has a lot of experience with, with this disease, it's, that's the, the comfortable place to be. I, you know, I've had so many patients come to me over the years and say, I'm so tired of teaching my physician about my disease. Um, and that's never a place you want to feel. You want to feel like you're going to a place where people understand um, what you're dealing with and you don't feel like you're the person having to drive that, that knowledge and conversation. Um, you definitely want to determine the extent of disease. That'll help you plan your, your treatment. Usually that management is going to include me in terms of, of surgery. And we'll talk a little bit more about that. And I think you guys are well aware, but sadly, it is not always known that there is no place for radioactive iodine in the setting of um, medullary thyroid cancer. I know we're surrounded by 92% of well-differentiated thyroid cancer in this conference and in the world. And everybody wants to talk about radioactive iodine, but it ain't for us, right? Because this is, we might as well be, we just happen to be two different cells in the same organ that have nothing to do with one another. And this C cell doesn't understand, it doesn't take up iodine, doesn't even look at it. Um, so there's no place for that in, in this. That's the, the, the follicular cell. Um, and then always reminding folks that we do have to go on thyroid hormone after we take the thyroid out, right? That's something that sometimes people forget to talk about when they talk to their patients. And it's not, it's not a trivial thing um, to have to do. Again, I think it's a great, a great um, 
ability that we have, that we have an organ that we can remove it in order to save lives um, and we have hormones to replace it. I am not diminishing that people do not always feel like themselves after we take out thyroids and they have to go on a thyroid hormone. I, I do not, and we're always looking on how to try to improve people's experience on, on um, thyroid hormone that they have to take um, as uh, you know once their thyroids are out. But these are the things that we think about. So what about the, the tumor markers? So this is, tumor markers help us understand kind of what the extent of disease is. And we really like to have this information while the thyroid is still in place because it can give us some prognostic factors. So just a reminder again, cancer markers are some substance that can be measured in the blood that help us follow cancer. Calcitonin is um, made by the C cell or the parafollicular cell, which is the basis of medullary thyroid cancer. It's a hormone. It is not a hormone that we really need. It's not like thyroid hormone that we need. We don't replace calcitonin once we take out people's thyroids, right? It's something that helps suppress calcium, but it is not something that, that is uh, necessarily or essential to our function but it's only made by, by these parafollicular or C cells. Um, and so it, it, when you don't have any C cells, that means you, your, your calcitonin should be very, very low. And that's a great thing. Now you might say to me, wait a minute, but I've heard about someone that had really bad disease that didn't have a calcitonin level. And that is, that can happen. And we're always thinking about that. That's when patients have medullary thyroid cancer that has gotten so advanced and kind of divided so much that it forgets that it's a parafollicular cell and it forgets I make calcitonin. So it stops making it. So we know that there are kind of two ends of the spectrum, but I don't want you guys to be like, my calcitonin is low. That means that I have this, this man-eating kind of medullary thyroid cancer. That is so rare. All right. And and we're always thinking about that, but that is that is very rare. Usually when calcitonin is low, that is a really good sign for us that um, that uh, th that you don't have evidence of disease or very small volume disease. The nice thing is that CEA is another, um, another tumor marker, much less sensitive for medullary. We follow it in a lot of different tumors, especially um, colon cancer. Um, but it also, it's, we, we always check calcitonin and CEA together. And one of those reasons is because just in case the, that cell forgets who he is and stops making calcitonin, he doesn't forget about CEA. That's a much more basic rudimentary tumor marker. And the cell doesn't forget to make that. So we often will look at ratios and we've published it looking at ratios of CEA and calcitonin to make sure to, to help us understand how aggressive disease are. So we want to know we really wanna know these things prior to surgery if we can, because they help us decide, um, do we think this cancer has spread outside the neck, right? But, um, and and so, so looking at calcitonin levels before that tumor, that thyroid has been removed um, can, give us, um, can give us a lot of insight. After surgery, it helps us understand whether one is cancer free or whether there is tumor and the amount of it and how quickly it increases, helps us understand where do we think this tumor is coming from. Um, so the, the, we use it in both ways. We use it at baseline and then we certainly use it afterwards. And we'll talk about that. So we're not gonna get, yeah, this is what you're gonna be. Um, this is gonna be empty blocks on the test and you guys are gonna fill it all in. Um, but this is, I know, right? I know, I know, I know. And it's so small, I'm so sorry, but you don't need to read it. Here's the thing to know about this. We talked about this. When we start doing MT, looking at MTC, we get the ultrasound, we get these tumor markers, and we do the analysis for RET. Like these are the things everybody should have done. And I promise you, we work with every physician we know to have them understand why this is so important for them to do. And that's part of our job um, when, when you work in this disease is how can you make sure you're communicating with other physicians um, so that they know how to, how to do this the right way, especially if they, you know, if patients can't get to centers that do this all the time, we need to go to them. Um, so, so with this, First thing you do when I get a calcitonin is I say, okay, what is my baseline calcitonin? If it's less than 500, that's a really good sign that the disease is probably still within the neck region. And that's a, that's a me problem as a surgeon, because this is where I, this is where I live and this is where I can do my, my work to, to, to treat the disease. If that calcitonin is greater than 500, when you haven't treated the disease yet, that's a sign that maybe this, maybe this guy has gotten curious and has gotten outside the neck. And that's when it's over 500, that's when we usually talk about before surgery, 
let's go ahead and get a little bit more imaging so that we can get an idea of where else this disease may be, because that might affect what we decide to do next. Um, you know, so, devil's advocate, let me just say it. Some people will be like, well, Libby, and some people at Anderson will be like, well, Libby, why don't you just take out the thyroid first and we'll see how far the calcitonin drops. And then we can just see, you know, if it goes to nothing, then it, that it obviously was all in the neck. And I get that, but for us, you know, when I sit with a patient, I want to be able to say, listen, this is, you know, I think this is all within the neck. And if we do this surgery, we have a really, really good chance of, of, um, uh, you know, of, of, of clearing this disease or, you know, this disease is not going to be something that clears us from, you know, we're, we're not going to be done with this disease, even after I finish with this, this next surgery. And, and we need to know that. And that also helps me sometimes know in surgery, what kind of, what kind of risk do I want to take? Right. My whole, I'm a very simple person. My life is in the operating room is, is benefit outweighing risk. And if benefit outweighs risk, I go down that path. How heroic am I going to be about trying to do a surgery and really pushing the edge of the envelope of, am I going to take this nerve or am I going to do this or that if I know that this is not even our biggest area of concern, that that's, you know, disease in the liver or somewhere else. So I, I want to know these things so that I can say, okay, benefit or risk, which path am I going down during surgery? So I think it's important to have that bigger view, um, if possible, uh, before the operation. It may not change what we do in the neck, because we know we also have to really take care of that disease in the neck as best we can, so it doesn't come back, so that we're not having to do this again later, right? So I'm not saying if you've got distant disease, you shouldn't do a bang up job and do the best you can in the neck, but sometimes we're making hard decisions and we we want to make sure that we have all the data to make the, the best decision we can. And we can, we can do that. So, so if your, your calcitonin is greater than 500, we're going to go look and, and look for, um, do things. Sorry. I thought I had another one. We're going to go look outside the neck. Usually what that means is we're going to look in the chest. That's usually with a CT. We're going to look in the abdomen and we're really going to focus on the liver because the liver is really the area within the abdomen where medullary thyroid cancer, if it wants to go within that cavity, will tend to go to the liver. So a lot of times we'll talk about getting an MRI of the liver because the um, MRI sometimes just gives us a better, um, it let us, lets us characterize um, nodules in the liver better. I, I will tell you guys this, and, and maybe you've already experienced this. Medullary is really, it kind of is an, it, really annoying in that it has chosen two areas of the body to go to that tend to make little nodules that sometimes can be like non-diagnostic, right? So we all know that the lung is a great thing for helping us filter things, right? It filters the air and it, as it's taking oxygen in and it protects us, but it also is really good at catching little things and little areas of infection that then scar or that are there. So there are a lot of little nodules that happen in the, in the lung that sometimes we're not able to say, do we think this is a cancer or do we think this is just some nonspecific nodule? And sometimes we just don't know. And, some, and that could be really annoying and frustrating for patients um, to be like, what do you mean you don't know? But that's why we, you know, a lot of times we, when we, we just take with a grain of salt when we do these, this imaging that we're gonna find things that sometimes we're just gonna have to follow that they're just small and, and they're not worth, they're not big enough to biopsy and they're not worth putting you through a biopsy because sometimes lung biopsies, again, benefit and risk. Is the benefit really there? If I don't even think they're gonna be able to get a tissue diagnosis of it. Why would we try? Um, and we just need to keep an eye on it because we wouldn't treat it differently anyway. And then the liver, the liver is another organ that tends to just make nodules in it that sometimes are very benign. And so we really have to sometimes just watch the, you know, I don't know if any of you are in this situation where we're like, okay, well, let's just image it again in a year and see if it's changed, right? And you're like, in 2023, that's as good as you can get as imaging in a year and see if it's changed. I mean, <laughs> that was better than the 90s. Um, but sometimes it is, that's what we do because again, doing a biopsy isn't gonna change anything. And that's the key. If we're not gonna change anything, why would we be doing, you know, why are we doing it? Um, and we just need to keep an eye on it. Um, and then the other thing that we'll often do is the axial um, spine MRI, because another place that um, medullary likes to go if it wants to leave the neck is sometimes bone. Um, and so those are the three big ones that, that we look at. Your physician might add different things like a, a head CT or, um, or head MRI, um, but, and, and we'll talk a little bit about dotatate in a, in a bit. Um, if that's something you guys are, are interested in, um, which is, is another scan that can be used. Um, but, but anyway, this is what we do. And then, um, 
Let me see what I'm now. I'm going to check. Okay, I got to here. We're not going to do this. That's boring. Okay, if you're going to do surgery, what I will say is most of the time as a surgeon, again, I, I'm a simple person. I look at the neck is the central neck and then the lateral neck. The central neck is the thing that contains the thyroid and your central lymph nodes. And the, the, the whole thing about it is it's just, it, it doesn't come with a label either, but it's between your carotid arteries on both sides. Those are the goalposts. And I know in between that area, when I take out those lymph nodes, that's the central neck. And then the lateral neck is everything to the side right there, which is um, the, the area out lateral to the carotid. And when you're doing an ultrasound, you're looking at all of that um, very carefully to see um, whether there's disease there. And so when you get an ultrasound, it's not just about the thyroid, it's definitely about the lymph nodes as well. Um, so, so that's what's really important. So if, if you're gonna address the central neck, we usually say, if you're gonna do surgery and you have a known medullary thyroid cancer, go ahead and take out the entire thyroid and go ahead and take out the lymph nodes within that central neck. Um, because the, the main reason we talk about that is um, we don't wanna ever go back in that neck. And I know that is sometimes a pipe dream with medullary thyroid cancer, but we wanna do that first operation and get and, and do as complete an operation to remove those lymph nodes um, and that the whole thyroid is possible because we don't wanna go back in there. Cause every time we go back in the neck, it's a little bit more risky because there's scar tissue. And so that gorgeous nerve that innervates your vocal folds, those little parathyroid glands that regulate your calcium, the more I put them at risk. And so I don't wanna go there. And so I wanna think ahead and be like, how can I stay out of this neck, right? Um, there has been some data or some papers published on if you have non-hereditary thyroid cancer, can you just as a first operation get a lobectomy or half your thyroid taken out? And this is kind of taken from the literature of papillary thyroid cancer, where we do a lot of that. And I would say in the right hands, you can have that discussion um, if you are going to be followed closely and the surgeon knows exactly what they're doing, meaning they're taking out that lobe and really cleaning out that side of the neck they're going into and leaving that other neck completely alone. I think that there is a, a place for that, but I think that's a really, a, that's, that's a upper level conversation that you're having because that's not standard of care. Um, but you know, in the right hands, I think all of these things are, are for, up for discussion for individual patients because at the end of the day, it's the patient and the physician that need to make this decision together about what's best for you as an individual. Um, so that's what we say there. I just wanna give one second. People are always like, I don't even understand what a neck dissection is. So just so that you're aware in our neck, like if I took out half, there's half the thyroid there, the other half's already been taken out. Underneath the thyroid, you've just got all of these little lymph nodes that are hanging out in a bunch of fat. We all have them. And they love, um, when medullary thyroid cancer leaves the thyroid, it really likes to go to the lymph nodes and set up shop. Um, and and um, we need to take those out. And the reason why is because sometimes these lymph nodes will just continue to grow. And these lymph nodes do not care about what they grow into. They'll grow into the nerve, they'll grow into the trachea, they'll grow into the esophagus. They do not care. And so we, a lot of times we, that's why um, we want to go ahead and remove them because they, they tend to continue to grow. Um, so that's why we talk about taking out all of that tissue on this side, we're talking about the right side uh, and removing that. Now you might be like, Ooh, Dr. Grubbs, look at that parathyroid sitting right in the middle of it. I know that's why it's so hard to do these operations. And we really worry about these parathyroids when we do it, because it, it's a challenge to save those parathyroids and take out the disease, but that's the job of the surgeon. And that's why you want someone that does this a lot um, so that they have the best chance of, of being able to keep some parathyroid tissue for you. Um, can't you just look for abnormal nodes in the central neck? And if you don't see them on ultrasound, you can leave them in. Absolutely not. We've shown that in the central neck, that thyroid creates a, a blind spot and we are no good at determining. And that's one of the reasons we are like, you just need to take the lymph nodes out. It's, and, and we're not that good at it either when we get in there and we're like, maybe this is benign, maybe it's malignant. We're not so hot either. We've done studies at that and surgeons don't really um, always know what they're, don't take that out of this room, but we don't always know what we're talking about there. Um, and then can pre-op calcitonin level guide a central neck dissection? 
Bottom line, no, it, it really can't. It, you know, this is a study that we all, everybody comes back to in the ATA guidelines. And all they did is they said, okay, this was their preoperative calcitonin level. And this is what they found on final path when you look at all the different compartments. And yes, they had 23 patients that when they were under a calcitonin under 20, nobody had any central neck nodes. So maybe you could look at that and be like, if you have a calcitonin under 20, you don't have to do a central neck dissection. Um, but, but that is a rare patient that I'm seeing that has medullary thyroid cancer and only, and has a calcitonin less than 20. Usually that's my patients that I'm doing prophylactic surgeries who, you know, for medullary, for, um, hereditary that have not developed disease yet. And that's when that discussion can really come in. Can you leave the lymph nodes if that you've not been diagnosed with medullary yet? But if you have the diagnosis, really central neck dissection is going to be the right answer, no matter what your calcitonin is. Um, with the lateral neck, I'm just going to get to cut to the chase. Um, we tend to in the United States and certainly at Anderson, we're huge believers. And if you get really good imaging and you have a, a, a lateral neck that does not have evidence of disease, you do not need to, to remove the, the lymph nodes in that, um, in that compartment. Others will say you need to do it based on calcitonin levels. And, um, and that's a very European thing. Like when they had the 2016, um, guidelines meetings, there was like, it you know, got contentious because the Europeans are like, yeah, if your calcitonin is greater than 20, we go ahead and clean out um, the, ipsil the, the same, the same lat side of the neck as the cancer. We go ahead and do that lateral neck dissection. Um, and, uh, and we're just, and if it's greater than 200, you're going to get a bilateral lateral neck dissection. And that's based again on this language where they were like, okay, well, let's look at the first person that had ipsilateral lateral neck disease. Well, there were 9% of the patients did it 20. So if your calcitonin is over 20, you're getting a lateral neck dissection. Oh, well, let's look and see when the first time they had on the other side of the neck, they developed lateral neck disease. It was 200. So if it's over 200, we're going to go ahead. That's a little crazy that we do that, but especially because this was done in an era, this data was in an era that was done before um, we routinely used really good ultrasound. So I, I just being a little bit careful about that, you can really overoperate. I think a lot of you probably have had a lot of surgery and, and you do, no one underestimates what it means to have lateral neck surgery and have those spinal accessories at, at risk and where you do your shrugging and your diet, like all of this, it, you just need to be, we need to be really thoughtful about just because we can do the surgery, should we do it at the time? Um, and we, we've had data at Anderson that shows that when we do it in the way that we do it with imaging, that, um, that it doesn't change outcome, that if you continue to be followed and you develop a medullary thyroid cancer in that other, other compartment, you can go in and remove it at the, that time. We always, when we do these surgeries in the lateral neck, make, we don't just go in and take out one lymph node, right? They used to call that berry picking. That's such a stupid way thing to say, but that's what it's often been called. And, um, and when we know that you don't do that, you go in and take out all of the, the, the lymph nodes in that area um, that are defined by anatomic boundaries. Um, we, again, risk of surgery, injury to the recurrent laryngeal nerve, injury to the external branch of the superior laryngeal nerve, which is not, doesn't give you that voice change, uh, that hoarseness as much, but can change that pitch of voice, which can be equally annoying, especially for a lot of singers. Um, injury to the parathyroid glands, which means you can have low calcium. And then the lateral neck things, the vagus nerve, which feeds into the recurrent laryngeal nerve that we have to be so careful about. Um, the spinal accessory that allows your, your shoulders shrug, um, your phrenic that allows your diaphragm to go up and down and the facial that give you, allows you to have that symmetric smile. And then a chyle leak, um, which is um, when you have a lymphatic tissue, there's so much lymphatic tissue in our lateral neck, we tie it all off, but sometimes you just can't tie everything. And, and you can get fluid that comes from that, that area where you cut the, the lymph nodes um, and, it, and, and that can, that can um, give morbidity as well. Um, so I will just say low back to me, if, if, if you're one of those patients that didn't have a um, diagnosis when you had surgery and it was only after they did the surgery, took out the, the thyroid nodule and said, okay, you have medullary thyroid cancer. Um, we don't necessarily, I personally, and in our practice at our institution is that doesn't mean you absolutely have to go back for more surgery. The cert first surgery has been done. You know this, we can't take it back. Do we need to double down and do more surgery if, you know, if, if we don't think the risk is, is um, the, if we don't think the benefit outweighs the risk? And we would say no there. 
um, if we don't see any radiographic evidence of disease, um, a lot of times we would just keep an eye on things. Um, and I now have enough gray hair that just uh, operating on calcitonin, I've, I've stopped doing because when I was young, um, I would. I would say, oh gosh, the calcitonin is going up. I got to get back in that neck and absolutely clean it out in that reoperative setting. And sometimes I wouldn't do, have any effect on the calcitonin. Um, and there's nothing sadder um, than, than doing that, but it's, uh, it, 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 it is a, a true thing. So if you've only had a lobectomy and you have non-hereditary, I think that there's something to be said for the watch and wait, especially if your calcitonin is very low. Um, I, I don't think that a completion is, is necessary. Again, you might say, well, then why wouldn't you do that up front? Well, you've already had a surgery in this setting. And so we're already, we're already one surgery in. And so we wanna be really careful about planning that second. Any further surgery needs to be thought of so carefully um, that, um, but the one time where we do talk about doing um, maybe doing a completion as if you had the hereditary form of the disease. And the reason why in that one is, again, every little cell, every little C cell in your remaining thyroid lobe, if it's still there, has that red mutation. And it's just waiting to develop a little MTC. So we, we, in that setting, we're like, let's just go ahead and remove it. Now, if you really, if patients who are hereditary, and I've had a couple are like, I really want to save that lobe. I'm like, okay, well, we'll see every six months, you know, and, and watch. And as soon as that calcitonin ticks up, we're taking it out or anything changes on ultrasound. But um, again, I think it's an individual thing, but most of the time we'll talk about just going ahead um, and removing that other lobe if, if they didn't know it at the time of the original operation. So follow-up, just a reminder, we use calcitonin and CEA before surgery and we use it after surgery. And we use it after surgery to look at absolute numbers to help us think, you know, do we think that this is um, just disease that's still in the neck? Do we think it's, uh, it's getting to a level where we think it's gone outside the neck? And then we also use the trend of the, of the calcitonin. You guys have probably heard doubling time. How long does it take the calcitonin to, to double itself? How long does it take to go from 16 to 32? If that's under 24 months, um, if that doubling time is under 24 months, that kind of piques our interest that this thing might be, you know, developing somewhere a little bit quickly. And we might say, well, let's see you back in six months instead of 12, right? So the, the, the pace at which stuff grows is there. Um, and then we, a lot of folks will get tested for calcitonin at, 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 at three months, six months is where we'll say as well, um, is really where we think it, it hits its rock bottom. Um, and so we, we usually wait about six months after surgery to, to check calcitonin for the first time. Um, and uh, at that point, uh, you know, we're really now looking to see what our, our new norm is after we've taken out um, that, that neck disease. Um, for advanced and, okay, so, so how do we use calcitonin after this surgery? So if you have calcitonin that is undetectable, after surgery. And that's when we, you know, that that's, that's when the patient and the physician are like, yay, we, we've got an undetectable calcitonin. I also now have enough gray hair that I don't say, well, we're done. And we never have to worry about this disease again, because we know that sometimes the calcitonin does go to undetectable, but there's one or two little cells that are somewhere harboring in a little lymph node somewhere that are going to develop over time. And we're going to have to deal with it. And I didn't get that little teeny tiny thing out when I was trying to save your nerves and, and, and um, some parathyroid tissue. Um, and so while it's always a good start, um, I don't ever, I don't, I don't over enthusiastically celebrate the undetectable calcitonin anymore because um, while important, it is not, it is not the end and it doesn't mean we don't need to keep following. But in that setting, if it's undetectable, We'll talk about just getting um, calcitonin CEA annually. We usually still will get an ultrasound annually as well, even though the calcitonin and CEA are really the important things because they're just so much more sensitive. They'll, they'll develop um, and they'll start to uptick before we ever see disease um, on imaging. Um, if the calcitonin is detectable after surgery or at any time, but it's less than 150, that's one of those things that we're like, yeah, um, you know, if it's, if it's less than 150 and there's no evidence of disease, we'll usually say, let's just check you every, you know, every, uh, about every six months with an ultrasound. And still, if it's under 150, it's still most likely that it's going to be in the neck and not outside of the neck, even after surgery. But if it continues to, to rise 
or that doubling time makes you nervous, then that's when you can say, you know what, it's time to look outside the neck and see if it's elsewhere. And that's where we go back to the, the neck, chest, liver, and axial MRI. So that, that post-operative calcitonin, an absolute value of 150 is something that, that, that triggers us, or if that doubling time is under two years. Um, and, and that's when we're gonna say, let's see a little bit more often than, um, that, than every year. Sometimes though, you, you'll get thyroid, you'll get medullary thyroid cancer that will still be detectable, but it, it'll sit there for years and years and years. And those are times where we'll sometimes start to say, okay, let's start spreading it out just a little bit. Um, we never say, see ya, but we'll say you can start spreading it out because you know we've shown stability. So that's something between you and your physician of like figuring out what's the sweet spot for, for how often, because I know it's not without its own angst um, you know, and anxiety to, to go back to the, the, to the doctor every six months and get an ultrasound, right? They're, they're, everybody always says to me, I was fine until I walked in here. Like every time I have to come back here, I'm just like, why? I like you, Dr. Cross, but not that much. And so we, we do try to balance that, I, I promise, and when we think about these things. Um, and it's something you can talk to your doctor about too, you know? I mean, they need to know these things that like, I'm miserable when I have to come back here, right? I mean, these are things you got to talk about together so that you can make the right plan because this is a marathon, right? This is not, this is not a sprint, this disease. Um, so we got to figure out what works, what works for you. Sorry to interrupt, but you have about three minutes left and uh, we have a couple questions in the chat. <laughs> oh my God. I didn't even know where that voice was. God. Uh, all right. It's me. So uh, what, the last thing I'll say, and then I'll stop is if it is greater than 150 after a surgery, that's when we do start looking for other sources after we've gone ahead and done the surgery. Um, and this is one of those times, that's when I'm gonna circle back and just say, if we can't find things, we tend to use the CTs and the MRIs to do the first thing. But if you're having increase in your calcitonin and we can't find it with those modalities, that's when we've started to use dotatate test, which is a which is a nuclear medicine study that is sensitive. And we have found in that setting that dotatate is sometimes helpful um, when, when conventional imaging doesn't help, um, it, it helps us uh, be able to localize um, more quickly. So I'm gonna, I think I'll stop there then y'all. Um, yeah, oh my God, it's perfect. Uh, and then well, yeah, that's how it goes. And then let's take questions. And then at the very end, I just wanna talk to you about one thing that we're doing that I'd love your help with. Um, but yeah, hit me with some questions. Thank you so much. I'm going to read the chat questions real quick, just so that our, our Zoom people can uh, get their questions answered. Um, this one has to do with multiple surgeries. Um, so it sounds like this person is wondering if calcitonin rises after the total thyroidectomy. Um, they had the uh, hemi, uh, hemi thyroidectomy, so mm -hmm. half out and one operation and then half out in the next. Before the second operation, their calcitonin was 170. Um, after the second one, it was uh, 1,020 with metastases in the liver. They're wondering if it's possible that this disease progresses in a short amount of time. So, yeah. So, so that's a great, oh, that's a great question. And what I would say, and this is really hard um, to, to kind of sometimes think, because what we would all like to think is if we could get everything taken out in the neck, that it won't go elsewhere, right? That like we've, we've contained it. But sometimes that's not how this disease chooses to, to live. It, 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 it kind of decides early on, I'm gonna be a I'm gonna be a jerk, you know, and I'm gonna I'm I'm gonna have a biology that is more aggressive and I'm gonna spread outside of the neck. And what I would why I'm saying this is getting that other this disease didn't just because they had the lobe out at that time in between, you know it didn't develop in that short period of time, probably to go to the liver right afterwards. It, it had, a, it, it knew that that's where it was headed. Um, so yes, what I would say in that setting is that is just an, a more aggressive disease where it's now not about the neck. It's going to be about the, um, it's going to be about outside of the neck. And that's where that pace of growth happens. And unfortunately we see that with MTC, right? That, 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 that it can not do anything and then it can pick up the pace um, with, with areas outside of the neck um, and, and grow. And so I, I think she, that per individual was just in the perfect storm of 
you know, between the lobectomy and, and getting the completion is when that disease, you know, really um, started to take off in the liver. Um, but, but yes, that increase in calcitonin like that is the thing that would make you say, this is not the next problem. This is somewhere else and we need to look for it. Thank you so much. Um, this next question, I think definitely is a doozy one, a doozy as well. So, um, if a patient had a right and central neck dissection, uh, right and central neck dissection resulting in a paralyzed vocal cord in midline and had a trach after surgery, what sorts of markers would you wait for to do the left neck surgery with the understanding that the risk may be a permanent trach? Um, and if they're looking for some very, very basic ideas and understand if you can't or un are uncomfortable answering. No, I, you know, I think these are discussions, unfortunately, we have all the time. Um, and it really, this is where I would say, again, when I'm with my patients, there's one you in the entire world, right? And all these guidelines are awesome but they're guidelines. And it really is about, you know, the values that, that each individual has and the risks and benefits of what they're, they're you know, what, what they're comfortable with. You know, what I, I would look at personally is an idea, you know, when we have one, one cord that is out, that really puts even more emphasis on what are we doing in the other, uh, you know, uh, when we're putting that other nerve at risk, it, there has to be a, a, a a real reason for that, right? That benefit really has to be there. And, and what I'll say to patients, and I think one of the worst surgeries I do is when I have one cord out with a medialized, uh, one nerve out with a medialized cord. And what we mean by that is that for those that don't know, you know, you're, when well, you got to breathe, your cords open. And when you, when you go to make voice and protect the airway, when, when you swallow and things, um, it closes. If you have a cord that's already medialized closed, that means if that other cord were also to be paralyzed closed, that would be the airway obstruction that would meet, necessitate you to have a trach. And um, what I would say is that's when you have to look at the disease. And what I say to patients very simply is, if there's disease that's growing in the side where that of your functioning nerve, um, that disease does not care about that nerve. I at least care about that nerve. One of us wants to protect it, right? And it sure should in the thing in the neck. So in that setting, that's when you have to do it. But that's, I, I sit a lot of patients and then I sit for a long time waiting for that disease to really declare itself before we decide that now is the time to take that calculated risk of surgery. So that's the conversation you have to have. It, it's not all one size fits all there. If there's no disease in that side of the neck, oof, let's watch that for, you know, that's one you could consider. Maybe we just, you know, take a, a win right now. And then if something grows, then we deal with it at that time. So that's, that's the hardest thing. I think sometimes for patients, and I get it so much is, there's disease in my de neck doc, let's go. We're gonna go take this disease out. And I'm like, no, no, no. Sometimes disease is just gonna hang out and it's not gonna do anything for years to decades. Let's live with it. And so that you don't have any of the risk, any of the side effects that we know are at risk for this. And then when it makes a move, we make a move. Um, but that's hard, you know, to, to know that. It, you gotta, it's a lot to, to, work, to kind of think through. Yeah, thank you so much. And I know we're a little over time, but um, just, because we have you and you're so amazing. Um, I, I thought I'd, if anyone in the room wants to ask, we have time for maybe one question, um, flag me down so you can have the microphones so that our colleagues in Zoom can hear you. Thank you for coming, first of all. Um, you talk a lot about pre-op calcitonin as guiding you mm -hmm. your surgical procedure. Um, and we all know calcitonin fluctuates. Mm -hmm. Do you look at size of the tumor is our guideline in other words um for size of tumor versus your guidelines for surgical so great question so again what i would say is calcitonin doesn't tell me how much operating to do in the neck like we we don't use the calcitonin to tell me how much to do you you can we don't tend to do that we we, we rely on imaging but calcitonin does help me know whether i think the disease is more widespread and therefore i might hold back on being more aggressive on a surgery in the neck because i we've got bigger things to worry about than than that but your question about tumor size so it's a great question because and the other 92 percent right that are the well differentiated thyroid cancers you do use tumor size to help you decide but I won't go through it, but I have a, a, a slide on size matter and microcarcinomas 
less than a centimeter, absolutely can go to the lymph node. So I, we don't give any credence to small size medullaries of getting off the hook and saying that you don't have to, to be really thoughtful about the extent of, of operating and you should really consider, um, you know, even with those, we consider total thyroidectomy and central neck most of the time. Um, do you, if I have a seven centimeter thyroid cancer, which is considered pretty large, would that make me say, ooh, I need to go do, you know, a more extensive neck dissection like lateral neck? In this setting, no, it doesn't. It's really strange. Some thyroid cancers are like, I have had medullary thyroid cancers that are seven centimeters and calcitonins of 6,000 and you take out their, their tumor and, and their calcitonin goes undetectable. And you're like, how did that happen? Sometimes people have really robust calcitonin producing tumors that just like, and they just, they do, and you take them out and it's fine. So I wouldn't, I wouldn't use that tumor size to, to tell me the extent of neck dissection that I would do. But it's a great question because when we always ask it, because every other cancer that I take care of, that size does help me determine the extent that I do. But in medullary, we're really careful with the micros because they can be doozies and don't let them fool you. Like, oh, they're just little things. Um, yeah, a great question. Thank you. Oh, yeah. Well, thanks everyone for attending and thanks for your really thoughtful questions okay. online and here. Oh, okay. and really yeah. quick. This is all that I want to say to you guys. We just put out, so we got a grant to put together a, um, an education site for patients with medullary thyroid cancer. And we, this, this website is, we've just launched it. It's called MTC educate. And when you go on dot, dot org, and when you go on it, you'll see at the top, it's not MD Anderson and it's not UCSF. Who's our, our partner, because we don't want this to be about Anderson or a UCSF or an individual site. We want people to be able to feel they can go use it no matter who they are or where they are. And we want physicians more importantly, to feel like they can let their patients go there and not feel like Anderson or UCSF is trying to take patients because we're not. We just want patients to be able to get education. So we interviewed 70 patients and caregivers and 10 physicians, and we came up with the content for this. And then at the entire time we were making the, the site, we kept going back to patients and having them review it and revise it. Um, we finished it. It's up. That's the RL code there. If you guys visit it, and a lot of you have, if you have, that's amazing. Thank you. What I would love for you to do is there's a survey at the top that pops up that says, we want your feedback. If you guys would be willing to take the survey and give us feedback about like what you like, and more importantly, what have we missed so that we can add it? This is really important because we work in academia and we're gonna take this and we're going to make it better and we're gonna publish on it. And that's how we get more money to be able to make more of these kinds of things. Everything I do has to be with an academic intent to it. And, and I want that survey so that I can A, make it better and show that this survey, that, that this website actually works. So if you'd be willing to do the survey, I would be so appreciative. Regarding, regarding the, the mtceducate.org, how does that get out to the thousands of doctors and okay. endos okay. that we all yep. go to see initially? So this is such a, oh. Okay, so this is how we have started and this is where we're going with this. So um, we have started with everybody that's in our registry and we have an MTC registry. And if you have any desire to be part of the MD Anderson UCSF registry, I didn't put a slide on there because I didn't want to, I didn't want to make this self-serving, but it's a registry that we do for, for all to try to capture more data on patients so that we can get a larger group of patients with this rare disease. And we have a, we'll be here all weekend. We have a booth outside if you guys want to sign up for it. Um, but we all, those patients get a newsletter that hypes this registry. We also, um, American Thyroid Association met last month and agreed that they're going to start linking this to their website, which is huge for us because they don't always link with like website. That's also one of the reasons we don't have like MD Anderson all across it because we want, we want it to be able to go to the ATA and ATA can't be like, you know, look like it's, it's, it's favoring one institution over the other. Okay. So we're doing that and that amend, which is a, a, um, and Vica, you guys, you guys put it out in your newsletter. That was a huge uptick. It gets, it's, the Medi Facebook page. Um, it was put on there. Thank you. And, and Gary helped with that, but now we've got to start figuring out other ways to get it out. And I am not the biggest social media person and I'm going to have to become the social media person because I think I, I have to get it on 
more on Twitter. I have to get it on Instagram. You guys are doing a great job pushing it out on Facebook. But if anybody has ideas or works in the social, it, like media or what's that? In LinkedIn for professionals, we need to put it on. So now we need to start doing this. And then the other thing we're doing is we are um, realizing, and I, I've been talking to some of you guys about this, is that we realize that, and we just presented this data at ATA, that um, you know we get people through this registry through tertiary care centers in FICA. That's still a very select group of patients. And so when we went and looked at whether our registry represented the full range of people that have this disease, and we did that by comparing it to the can uh, California and Texas Cancer Registry and the National Registry base, or not. Meaning, you know, 30% of our patients in in Texas with MTC, based on the can the um, state cancer registry, are Hispanic. We have 8% Hispanic in our registry. Same for for Black Americans and looking at people in rural settings. So, our job now is to start community engagement. People that aren't coming to us, we have to figure out how to get to them. And I think part of that is um, through going to patients directly and we're working with folks that, that excel in community engagement to do that and getting to the physician. Because a huge number of patients, Megan Haymart, who's gonna be here, I think tomorrow, wrote a great paper about how many patients with thyroid cancer see their PCPs. We've gotta figure out, it's just hard in a rare disease. Because it's like, if you ever, right? Like you, you know, people will be like, go sit at a health fair. And I'm like, what? So the one in time they see this their entire life, they'll remember that I, they saw me at a health fair. That doesn't work. So we have to figure out how to be smarter in a rare disease, but it's a great challenge and we need to, to do it. So if any of you have ideas or thoughts or, or want to be engaged, we'd love to, we, we want to, partnering with patients is, is really important to us. We have a patient stakeholder group that, that um, Gary set up with us of, of five individuals with, with medullary thyroid cancer that we meet with quarterly. And, and we're going to be looking for, for people as those people rotate off to come um, and would love, you know, some of you to consider, but that's some of the things we talk about is like, how do we get this word out? Because it's not going to happen unless we, it's only been out for a few months. So we're still novice, we're, we're, but we need to get it out in every opportunity we can. So thank you guys for that. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you.